Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar in the SORTUP and ESCCP webinar series. My name is Rula Deeb. I'm a senior principal at Geosyntac Consultants in Oakland, California and the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of SORTUP and ESCCP. I'll be facilitating today's call. The webinar will consist of a brief overview of both programs followed by the technical portion of the presentation. Uh, today's event focuses on Department of Defense research efforts on improved methods to evaluate aerial emissions and develop pollutant emission factors. First, Dr. Brian Gillette from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency will talk about the development and application of aerial emissions sampling methods. His presentation will be followed by a brief question and answer session. Second, Dr. Kevin McNesby from the U.S. Army Research Laboratory will discuss additional methods for evaluating emissions. We will conclude the webinar with an interactive Q&A session with both of today's speakers. The broadcast will be listen only you may submit questions by using the chat box on the left-hand portion of your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions. In fact, we do encourage you to submit questions well in advance of the Q&A session. On this slide, we have provided a few suggestions in case you experience difficulties with the broadcast audio. Typically, any delay will be fixed if you experience, if you experience uh, typically, uh, I apologize, typically any delay will be fixed if you refresh your screen or call into the conference line shown here. However, if you continue to have problems, please submit a chat in the chat box in the lower left corner of your screen. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce um, uh, the Program Area Manager for Weapons Systems and Platforms, Dr. Robin Nissan, and Robin is going to give a brief presentation on startup and ESCCP. Robin? Thank you, Rula. I'm pleased to welcome everyone to today's startup and ESCCP webinar. Slide 9. CERTIP is the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program, and it was established in 1991 by Congress as a partnership between the DOD, Department of Energy, and the EPA. CERTIP's mission is to identify and address high-priority environmental science and technology opportunities that focus on DOD requirements. CERTIP funds both fundamental research as well as advanced technology development that ultimately impacts real-world environmental management. Slide 10. ESTCP is the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program in which we demonstrate innovative environmental and energy technologies. These investments capitalize on past investments made under CERTIP or other research programs and are designed to transition technologies out of the lab and into the field. Especially important in all ESTCP demonstrations is the ultimate transition to implementation and regulatory acceptance. CERTIP and ESTCP are complementary programs with much of CERTIP research occurring at the lab and pilot scale with occasional field efforts, while ESTCP demonstrations are primarily at the pilot and field scale, although occasionally supporting laboratory development efforts are conducted. Slide 11. So there are four program areas in CERTIP and five in ESTCP, with energy and water uh, as a program area being only in ESTCP. The other four, environmental restoration, munitions response, resource conservation resiliency, and weapon systems and platforms are CERTIP and ESTCP programs managed jointly by one designated program manager. Slide 12. Uh, today's webinar is focusing on research and demonstrations that were conducted, conducted under the weapon systems and platforms program area. Uh, this program area has several focus areas, including surface and engineering uh, of structural materials, energetic materials and munitions, uh, noise and emissions, uh, waste reduction, 
and also uh, some efforts in lead-free electronics. Our webinar series highlights research and demonstration efforts from each of the five program areas. And as you can see, upcoming webinars will cover a broad range of topics, including natural attenuation of chlorinated ethenes, uh, overview of the Defense Coastal Estuarian Research Program, and quantifying and modeling fugitive dust emissions from DOD activities. The next WP webinar is on April 5th and will focus on advanced nanocrystalline cobalt alloys as alternatives for chromium and nickel plating in repair operations. You can find more information about upcoming webinars at this link. Registration is now live for webinars through the end of the calendar year, and I would like to remind you that a copy of the presentation of today's session can be downloaded from our webinar page. We would appreciate it if you would uh, kindly take uh, a moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen at the end of this web webcast. So it is my pleasure to announce that the CERTIP ESTCP Symposium will again be held in November, next November, in Washington, D.C. The three-day event will showcase the latest technologies that enhance DOD's mission through improved environmental and energy performance. Registration information will soon be available on the CERTIP and ESTCP website. With that, I hope you enjoy today's webinar. Back to you, Rula. Uh, Dr. Nissan, this is Brian Galletz. I'm with the Environmental Protection Agency in the Office of Research and Development, and I'm located in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. It's my pleasure today to talk to you about development and application of aerial emissions sampling methods. Uh, just a real brief on the agenda, I'm going to talk about what the problem is that we were trying to solve and why this is relevant to the Department of Defense. We'll talk about our research objectives and how we achieved them with the methods that we've developed. We'll talk about the field results in applying these methods and briefly talk about current, future efforts, and finally wrap up with acknowledgments. So what is the problem? So in general, open area emission sources are poorly characterized, and this is because of a number of reasons. First of all, the difficulty in, in characterizing them. And secondly, the, the agencies, the EPA's traditional focus has been on uh, sampling from stationary sources that have smokestacks or the like. And so as a consequence, there really are no established EPA methods for sampling open area sources. There are a couple of uh, other test methods, but they have not been uh, codified at this point. So sampling open area sources presents a considerable challenge to personnel safety and equipment survivability, especially as we look at some of the sources that are relevant to the Department of Defense. So some of these sources that are relevant to the Department of Defense include demilitarization operations, which includes open burning and open detonation of uh, ordnance, munitions, propellants, bombs. These uh, items are obsolete or hazardous. They have a shelf life. And this is relevant to the Department of Defense because these facilities are required to have air permits. Uh, open area sampling is also relevant to DOD because of waste disposal, primarily at uh, forward operating bases overseas in theaters of operation. And this has been infamous from the, uh, the burn pits that are used to dispose of waste in some of these cases uh, because of inhalation exposure issues. The Department of Defense also has to consider open area sources when it comes to land management practices. This is primarily related to prescribed burns that occur on installations. The Department of Defense is the second largest landowner in the United States and so maintains a very active role in maintaining training uh, grounds for uh, military training, for uh, species conservation, and also to limit fuel accumulation to reduce the risk of uh, wildfires, un undesirable fires. And lastly, open area sources of relevance to the Department of Defense because they try to maintain their ranges, 
Uh, this is either gun firing or point of impact for uh, detonations, and this is an issue because of potential soldier exposure as well as uh, contamination of the land. So the pollutants that are relevant to the Department of Defense are, are pretty ubiquitous. It depends upon the source, of course. Uh, it depends on whether there's uh, inhalation concerns or air permits or contamination. And these include a variety of pollutants, uh, particulate matter, metals, of course, uh, a variety of organics, both volatile and semi-volatile, including carbonyls, dioxins, energetics from the propellants, or pH as polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. In some cases where there may be chlorinated sources, there's HCl as a concern, as well as perchlorate, and of course also carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. So the, our objective in developing these methods was to create and demonstrate a, a sampling method that was relevant to Department of Defense open area sources. And as you can imagine, the challenges were numerous. Obviously, one wants the sampling equipment to survive whether it be a fire or a detonation. Uh, there's also hazard to personnel. This is not a typical stationary source sampling, so obviously we want personnel to be safe. We have to also get the equipment into plumes. If they are um, combustion events, they're typically plumes that are rising into the air. And as I mentioned before in a previous slide, there's a variety of different source characteristics, whether it be metals or chlorinated compounds, et cetera. We also want to make sure that we have a representative sample, um, and we all want to ensure that the data is of sufficient quality to be useful. And we also need to be efficient in our sampling, because this can be fairly expensive for field efforts. So what methods did we develop? CERTIP has funded in 2010 an aerial sampling method in which we used a five meter diameter, about 16 foot diameter, helium filled balloon to lift an instrument package. This balloon is tethered to the ground. And we'll show that in the next slide. And the idea was to maneuver the balloon into the plume, whether it be a forest fire or a detonation or a propellant burn, and sample uh, the pollutants. The instrument package that we used and developed at the EPA is called the Flyer. It was comprised of both commercially available and manufactured systems. It's a multi-pollutant sampler that's about uh, a one and a half foot cu uh, cube. It is suspended underneath that helium-filled aerostat. And as I mentioned before, we have either single or double tethers which are attached to the balloon and then down to a remotely controlled winch, which is mounted on the back of an XUV. So with the advent of uh, unmanned aerial systems, or sometimes called drones or unmanned aerial vehicles, also teensy computers, uh, sensors, and the technologies for 3D printing allowed us to make considerable advances in the size of this instrument package. The previous one, which we had called the Flyer, and this one, which we call the Colibri, which stands, which uh, is, uh, means hummingbird in some European languages. This is a smaller and much lighter sampler system. You can see the size from the foot-long red ruler on the left-hand photograph. Again, we suspend this underneath the, the uh, to the aerial sampler system, the uh, drone in this case. Typically what we do is use a multi-copter drone uh, as, as opposed to a fixed wing drone. And then we're able to maneuver the multi-copter into the plume from a safe distance but within line of sight. On the right hand side of the picture you see a cutaway and opening up of the Colibri system and all its components. This is a slide which compares the size and the weight of the flyer on the right and the colibri on the left. And you can see that we've made considerable advances in terms of transitioning this from a fairly large, uh, sometimes hard to maneuver helium filled balloon to the smaller, uh, more nimble uh, multi-copter or UAS. 
These are a couple pictures of us applying the helium-filled balloon with the flyer instruments suspended underneath. We are on the left-hand picture. We are sampling the plume of an open propellant burn, and on the right, we have pre-positioned the balloon downwind of a detonation plume, and we have moved the personnel off to a safe distance, and the, the tethered lengths are controlled by uh, remotely by control to keep the people out of the uh, range of hazard. And now we're going to see a video application on sampling. This is a Google Earth three-dimensional image of one of the flight paths of the drone system with the Colibri. It goes from one to eight, and on the right side you can see a little uh, chart which indicates the flight time, the height level above sea level, and also the carbon dioxide values. The line, the green line, is actually color-coded to indicate the CO2 concentrations. Red is obviously the highest CO2 concentration, which means that we are positioned well within the plume. The white lines are simply a projection of the flight path down to the ground, which re results in the black line. So you can see in this example, when we've sampled open burning, we were in flight a little over two minutes, and we got carbon dioxide concentrations up above 4,000 parts per million, indicating that we're in the plume and doing a good job of collecting sample. This next slide shows us another open burn application. If you look about midway through the plume, you can see another little black dot. Again, that is the, the drone, which has been flown by NASA. It was commissioned by, in both cases, it was commissioned by the Army to fly the NASA, this NASA drone into the plume, carrying our sensors and sampler system. This is another picture of the drone a little bit closer up. You can see on the right-hand side, you can see in the top right, you can see the white filter, which is actually collecting the particles. And on the bottom, you can see that we've obviously been very successful at sampling the plume because the filter is very black. I should point out that these, these uh, aerial measurements that have been conducted over the last seven years, eight years, are pretty much the first measurements that have been made on these open burning, open detonation sources from the air. Some limited airplane measurements were made uh, about 20 or so years ago, um, but due to the limitations of the residence time of the airplane flying through the plume and also altitude uh, restrictions, the sample catch was exceedingly low. 
So this, this method is a substantial improvement over what had been employed in the past. This is a 3D Google Earth image of the, the other, uh, the second application I showed you. Again, following the green is the lower carbon dioxide concentrations, red is the highest ones, and you can see we had flight times of uh, up to seven minutes, and s again, fairly substantial CO2 concentration, indicating successful positioning of the drone into the plume. So in terms of results, uh, these are the f basically the first ever plume measurements of PM 2.5, that is particulate matter that's of 2. microns in mass median diameter. During this, these seven years, we have taken the first ever measurements of covered open detonation, that is soil covered open detonation. We also have taken the first ever measurements ever made on a rocket static firing in which uh, obsolete rocket motors are placed in stands, either horizontally or vertically, uh, ignited, and the plumes uh, arise and are sampled. We've also been able to look at metal partitioning and between the air and the ash that remains in the pan, and this allows us to provide an estimate of the amount of metal that may either be uh, retained in the ash and is then collected or it goes up in the air. Uh, one of the major things is that we've basically found no uh, uh, energetics, no nitroaromatics or nitrocellulose in any of our samples uh, from open burning. Um, and when we have looked at emission factors that resulted from this work and compared those that were estimated for the risk assessment, the vast majority of them are substantially lower than uh, used in the risk assessment. So. These results do give us, a, uh, are able to ground truth against uh, uh, emission measurements, or sorry, emission calculations and estimates that were made previously. And uh, finally, I, I would like to say that uh, this is, as far as I can tell, this is the most comprehensive UES or drone-based pollutant measurements uh, that's been in the literature today. And we've developed these substantially since 2010 and sampled uh, over 300 open burn events with multiple ordnance types, um, many open detonations, and many static fires, and we'll be continuing to do that. Let me, sh let me sh start briefly on application of these same instrument systems to gun firing, and this is sort of a segue into my colleague, Dr. Kevin McNesio, who will follow me up. The, we did some emission sampling of gun firing by building a plexiglass box around the outside of an M4 carbine. And so basically we're doing the same open area sampling here, but on a much smaller scale. And we created, a, moved our sampling instruments to sample the um, the firing at the gunpoint. You can see the nice black cloud that came off of this, which uh, Kevin will discuss later on. And these are just some of the results that enable us to look at different sizes of particulate matter that came out of the, the gun barrel with different types of ammunition, which you see along the uh, x-axis on the bottom. So we are able to distinguish uh, quite well differences in emission compositions in terms of particulate matter as well as a host of other pollutants, which I won't cover at this point. So uh, as I said, we were able to distinguish between bullet types. Uh, one of the interesting things from this work was the decombustion efficiency, which is the ratio of, of carbon dioxide over CO plus CO2, was actually very low. It was 0.44 to 0 0.50, which is much lower than we've seen in most other sources. So the question is whether these high CO concentrations cause an exposure issue. PM 2.5 concentrations were also fairly high. And to give one a relative feel for how significant these levels are, I just compared them to the one hour ambient air standard. And so one could meet this carbon monoxide standard for one hour, of course, by simply adding 11 cubic meters of dilution air to that CO. Um, it was a fair amount worse for PM 2.5, where you have to add a substantial amount of dilution air to get to the PM 2.5 standard. Um, 
So, of course, in an open area range, this is not necessarily an issue uh, unless there's a substantial amount of firing going on and uh, there's not much wind movement. Uh, in an indoor range, it might be of more, more of an issue. Finally, in conclusion, I would like to say that we've, as I've shown in a previous slide, we've developed these methods in over 20 campaigns with substantial number of burns and detonations. We've also done a fair number of uh, forest fire, prescribed fire emissions, uh, and we've significantly developed in the last seven or eight years these methods for characterizing open area sources. These methods are applicable to not only DOD needs uh, related to demilitarization, but also conservation needs, training land issues, uh, range contamination, and soldier health, of course. Uh, our work has provided a scientific basis behind support for air permits and land management practices. These are some of the most representative data because we're actually sampling the source rather than doing a small-scale simulation or a model development. So that's pretty critical. And these methods are also applicable to other open area sources, such as lagoons, landfills, oil and gas operations, et cetera. So in the future, we hope to continue this work, uh, developing, adding new sensors and uh, looking at new sources. And I'd like to acknowledge, of course, uh, the CERTA program and the ESCCP program, which over the last seven years have sponsored us through uh, many different uh, projects to develop these instruments and these methods. Uh, my own office, the EPA Office of Research and Development, made contributions as well as the Army's Joint Munitions Command, uh, the Department of National Defense in Canada, the U.S. Geological Survey, and the Air Force Institute of Technology related to forward operating bases and burn pits. Uh, there is more information that's available uh, on the CERTUP website, and these are some of the uh, web links that you can go to to find out some more information. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, I would like to remind our audience to submit questions by using the chat box on the left-hand portion of the screen. We have received a number of questions, uh, starting with uh, a first one, Brian. How are DOD installations using the data from open burn and open detonation studies? That's a really good question. It really is uh, installation specific, and it depends to a large extent on uh, the timing of their air permits requirements. But I think in general, the installations that I know of are using these data to work with the, the State Department of Environmental Protection, or DEQ, to um, to, to, to facilitate their air permits, and I think they're also my, I think they're also trying to be good neighbors to um, actually make it clear what what the emissions actually are. So it's uh, they're trying to be uh, transparent in understanding their emissions. Thank you. Can you tell us whether the samplers that you use and also the sensors whether they're commercially available, and if so, where? There are some components like uh, sampling pumps, which we have uh, fabricated ourselves, but um, some of, most of the samplers and the sensors are available commercially. Uh, they are, they are uh, particle cascade impactors uh, with commercially available, some commercially available pumps, and there are also uh, sensors, electrochemical sensors that are available um, commercially. Um, I, don't want to endorse any specific product, uh, but I think if people look at our journal papers, they can find the, the name of the uh, companies. And I should also point out that many of the sensors that are available today are not applicable to these types of applications because they, are, they, don't, they do not um, carry the capacity for particle loading as well as the concentrations, and they also have interference effects. So they ha people have to be really careful what, what types of sensors they use for this work. Thank you so much. Um, are you using EPA methods for sampling? So uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, there are no EPA uh, sampling methods for these open area sources. There is one OTM method that's an open path method which is not necessarily applicable to a uh, 
a plume which rises above the ground. Uh, but we are using um, we are using principles of EPA sampling methods, and all the methods go through a rigorous QA uh, validation beforehand. Now we use we use uh, when I say there are no EPA sampling methods, that means that there are no overarching methods, but there are methods for uh, doing uh, individual components like the, C, the, the emission monitoring. That's all validated under EPA protocols and methods. Thank you. Uh, with the particle size measurements that you made, are you able to ascertain whether the particles will fall to the ground or stay in the atmosphere for a long period of time? So we are looking at, I didn't go into this too much, but we are looking at par particle size distributions. And one of the instruments that we have on there is actually a, a particle sizing instrument which puts things into different bins. So the answer to that question basically is yes. We are able to look at particles that are much smaller than 2.5 micrometers and much larger. And obviously the larger ones are more prone for de uh, deposition. Thank you. When you sample the active plume using aerial equipment, uh, does the particulate matter impact the quality of the data? Are there any biases involved? And if so, which contaminants are impacted by the particulate? So we have had, uh, we have had some challenges uh, to, especially with open detonations, where there are a large amount of particles in the air and we have looked at methods and have employed methods that have pre-cyclones to take out large particles prior to getting to the impactors that may, for instance, look at PM 2.5. Thank you. Are the emission factors that you are publishing being used to justify emissions at specific locations? Uh, I, I'm not really privy at, at this point as to say how the uh, the state permit writers are using these data. I, I don't really know at this point. Great, thank you. Uh, this is a question from the um, state of South Dakota. Are there concerns or data on the effect of propeller, propeller airflow on the sampling results? Yeah, that's a great question, and I always get that. And we've looked at that about three different ways. Uh, and so far, we've actually found very little impact of the, the uh, downwash from the drone. Uh, we've looked at, we've simulated uh, collections behind fans. We've compared the, uh, the drone measurements to the balloon measurements, which obviously the, the aerostat or the balloon does not have the same issue. And we've come out with virtually the same emission factors. Uh, th obviously, this is a, a continuing question, but I, I think we've pretty much resolved it to our, to our satisfaction. And, and surprisingly, for the very small particles, they follow the fluid streamlines and are not impacted by the downwash. Thank you. You're getting so many questions, we're not being able to keep up. Uh, we have time for a few more, so I'm going to keep going. What is the temperature limitation of the drone's measurement um, equipment? That is, can this equipment be applied to stationary stack sampling? Yeah, I, I would say probably no, because the, the, the electronics in there typically are limited to 50 degrees Celsius. So um, by the time the plume gets to the, to the samplers, uh, there's a fair amount of ambient air dilution and it's fairly cool. So rarely do we exceed 50 degrees Celsius. Thank you. Um, how does the drone study design and conclusions account for the variability in the types and amount of uh, waste in each burn and uh, detonation event, even when conducted at the same facility? So if I understand the question, uh, we are able to discern uh, differences in composition. So typically when we determine an emission factor, the relative standard deviation in the emission factor is perhaps around 25%. So it's pretty, actually pretty low. Uh, so we, we are able to discern uh, distinctions between uh, different compositions uh, in the emissions. 
Thank you. Another question from the state of South Dakota. When might these types of data be incorporated into emission factors usable for permitting OB facilities? Yes, yeah, so that is really a question that has to be sort of answered at the state level. Um, I think the states sort of have priority to decide whether they think the data are sufficient uh, for their use. Again, that's not a call that I really can make. That's sort of a state level decision. Thank you. Um, a question from the U.S. Army. Do your future efforts also look at burns of material potentially presenting explosive hazards, not just material documented as explosive hazards? Uh, at this time, we don't have any plans uh, outside of this year to look at anything other than ordinance that's in the, uh, in the DOD stockpile. Thank you. Uh, can you please uh, remind us how were the air sensors uh, selected? Sure. As I mentioned before, there's obviously criteria of uh, size and weight. We're trying to minimize them. Um, they are typically all commercially available, so, they're, so we've borrowed in some cases from the technologies for personal sampling. Um, but we've had to test these sensors in our laboratory and under combustion conditions to make sure that the, the high particle loading um, uh, do, doesn't affect any of the results, uh, to make sure that they're applicable to the concentrations that we need um, in these plumes. As, I'm, as you saw, some of the CO2 concentrations, for instance, are above 4,000 parts per million. So it's not, we can't take typical uh, ambient air sensors and use them in these applications. Thank you. Are any ground-based active remote sensing technologies used during the campaign? And do you use any active remote uh, sensing technologies on your aerial platform? Uh, we don't. We, the the CERTIP had funded some uh, optical remote sensing uh, in the first year, but its, uh, its applicability was and success was limited. Uh, but of course, that was several years ago. So, but, but the answer is no, we do not use anything like that at this time. Great. Thank you. Um, do your, um, have you performed simulations on the testing, and how well do these simulations compare to your field data? So we have looked a little bit at um, the model that's typically used by the Department of Defense, the open burning, open detonation model, but uh, that's really something uh, for future investigation. And also, uh, I think my colleague, Kevin McNesby, will be talking a little bit about that very question in the next talk. Great. Thank you, Brian. I think this is an excellent segue to Kevin's presentation. We have a few more uh, questions that we have not had the chance to answer, and we'll save those for the uh, concluding Q&A session. So with that, I would like to go ahead and introduce our second speaker, Dr. Kevin McNesby. Kevin is a member of the Explosives Technology Branch, Lethality Division, Weapons and Materials Research Directorate at the U.S. Army Research Laboratory. Since 2010, Kevin has served as team leader in the Detonation Science Branch. He is currently serving as Acting Chief of the Explosives Technology Branch. Kevin has held past positions as Program Manager for Propulsion and Energetics at the Army Research Office in North Carolina, Visiting research, uh, Researcher at the University of California, Davis, and Instructor at the U.S. Naval Academy. Kevin received a BS in Chemistry from Washington College and a PhD in Physical Chemistry from Georgetown University. Kevin? Thank you. This is Kevin McNesby. I'm speaking to you from the U.S. Army Research Laboratory at the Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland. We're about 40 miles north of Baltimore. 
Uh, I'm going to be talking today about developing methods for evaluating emissions from guns and explosives with a concentration on metallized energetic materials. Slide 42. Um, just as a brief presentation outline, I'll uh, provide a, an introduction uh, to what we're doing. I'll talk some about the facilities we use, and then I'll get to the two main topics, which are going to be gun firings and explosions, and then I'll discuss some conclusions based upon the results of our work. Slide 43. So we're quantifying gases and medical particles produced during explosions and gun firings because we want to improve on soldier safety. And the way we uh, approach this is we use the observed and measured stages of energy release of the energetic materials to guide our simulations. And we then compare measurements to the simulations and try and figure out ways to uh, improve the simulations with the ultimate goal to predict all uh, of our energetic release events with simulations. And we have two uh, metrics that um, we use. One is the modified combustion efficiency, which uh, is a way to measure the degree of carbon oxidation. A modified combustion efficiency, or MCE, equal to 1 indicates that all initial carbon has been fully oxidized to CO2. The second metric that we use uh, is the emission factor, which uh, is used to quantify emissions of, of a particular polluting chemical. And that is generally the grams of polluting chemical emitted per gram of uh, starting material or fuel. Slide 44. So the two systems we looked at were, were gun firings using the M4 carbine firing M855 ammunition. The M4 is the military replacement for the M16. The M855 ammunition is a copper jacketed steel lead bullet with a caliber very close to a 22 caliber, 5.56 millimeter diameter. And for explosions, we use TNT, the most common uh, solid chemical explosive. And we also investigated TNT to which 20% by weight of a metal formulation uh, has been added. Slide 45. <coughs> The facilities we used uh, for chemical analysis, the EPA fieldable system that Dr. Gallet just described. Um, this um, uh, instrumentation suite was uh, transported to Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland and uh, installed at our uh, indoor blast facility at the Army Research Lab. And this indoor blast facility is an instrumented gun room which is contiguous to a um, blast chamber. So the guns, for gun testing, guns were fired and the bullet caught in the blast chamber. For explosions, the, uh, the blast chamber itself was uh, used to contain the, uh, the explosion. Slide 46. I'm not going to be getting into the individual systems. On slide 46, on the left, you see a photograph of an M4 carbine. Uh, on the right is a uh, photograph and diagram of the M855 ammunition that shows uh, for the bullets we used, a lead slug and a steel penetrator, and that's the part of the bullet that has the 22 caliber diameter. And then uh, the double base propellant, with double base being nitrocellulose, nitroglycerin. And then to the propellant are added potassium salts to suppress flash. Slide 47. This is a, a picture of uh, the uh, methods we used for the gun firings. On the left, you see a picture that Dr. Gallette showed of uh, the firing of the M4 and the outline of the box used to contain the sensors and contain particles and gases emitted from the muzzle of the weapon during firing. On the right upper is uh, a view of the full rig in place showing the gun, the EPA um, 
sensing equipment on a cart in front of the gun. Uh, if you look closely there, you can see the muzzle protruding into a plexiglass box, and behind it is a large screen that we used for Edgerton shadowgraphy. On the lower right is a picture of the EPA particle sampling modules uh, about 10 centimeters away from the muzzle of the M4 protruding into the plexiglass box. Slide 48. So for gun firings, uh, the simulations used a um, computational fluid dynamics based simulation that enabled us to model the flow in interior ballistics. And interior ballistics is everything that occurs before the bullet exits the barrel. And we also use the same model for the exterior ballistics, exterior ballistics being everything that happens after the bullet uncorks and the gases that drove the bullet down the barrel then exit into uh, our enclosure. So this computational fluid dynamics model was coupled to an equilibrium thermodynamic code, the NASA Lewis thermochemical code, that had been modified to allow uh, soot formation within the uh, interior ballistic cycle within the barrel. And uh, for comparison, we used the Lawrence Livermore code, cheetah, um, to predict species. And uh, then these were uh, then input into a chemical uh, combustion code known as Chemkin to give us a comparison um, for predicted species. Slide 49. This slide shows some results of the computational fluid dynamics model. On the left is uh, a graph showing uh, species concentration versus time uh, after firing. And you'll notice that the, uh, the species produced within the gun barrel, carbon dioxide, methane, ammonia, don't come on the graph until about eight milliseconds after uh, the trigger is pulled. And that delay is because it takes time for those species to diffuse to the EPA sensors, and that's reflected in the simulation. On the right is a, uh, a map of the CO2 concentrations 0.6 milliseconds after muzzle exit. Slide 50. Um, this slide shows. Um, some uh, numbers of uh, emission factors and modified combustion efficiency that we pulled from the simulations to compare later to experiment. On the left, you'll see the uh, major species predicted by the computational fluid dynamics model. And a quick perusal of this will show that most of the carbon here is predicted to have been oxidized fully to CO2. Uh, on the right is the uh, simulation uh, estimates for the modified combustion efficiency. And the NASA Lewis simulation, which is the uh, one that accounts for soot, uh, shows that about 73% of the carbon is fully oxidized. And the, um, the reason that's not one is because uh, soot in the amount of almost uh, over 25% has been produced. In the cheetah Chemkin calculation, uh, soot is not predicted, and hence the combustion efficiency is, is close to, predicted to be close to one. Um, slide 51 shows the actual experimental results, and there's two uh, really interesting things here. Most interesting, at least to us, what is the fact that the experiments uh, showed a combustion efficiency of around 0 0.5 for the uh, salted ammunition. That's the ammunition that has the additive to suppress muzzle flash for the unsalted. And also the legacy rounds, which are Vietnam era rounds, show combustion efficiencies near 0 0.5. And uh, so that means that most or half of the carbon, initial carbon, is um, not fully oxidized. And as you would expect, the, uh, the CO emission factors are higher than initially predicted. So um, on slide 52, 
we see the um, particulate emission factors, which Dr. Gallette mentioned uh, in his talk, for the salted uh, rounds are higher than both legacy uh, rounds tested. This is because the, at the salt additive, which is potassium, uh, the flash suppressant is a combustion suppressor. And so when the secondary combustion is suppressed, and hence reducing the muzzle flash, the particulate increases because a, a good proportion of muzzle flash is incandescence of particles. So when that when the the combustion is suppressed, the there's more particles. Uh, on the right side of uh, slide 52, you'll see the uh, elemental emission factors. Uh, for the salted round, it's not surprising that potassium is uh, present. Uh, we also measured the highest uh, element we measured was. Uh, copper. We believe this is from the uh, jacketing of the bullet, which is etched by the rifling in the barrel uh, as, as the bullet exits the barrel. We also saw more lead than was present in the primer formulation, so we, we, we suspect this may be indication of the lead slug uh, contributing to some of the measured uh, lead uh, in the particles. Uh, slide 53. Moving now to um, explosions. Um, on the left of this uh, uh, chart, you see a picture of the explosive train for the TNT charges. It's a 2 by 8 right circular cylinder of neat TNT weighing in at 640.9 grams. A composition B booster, which is a mixture of RDX and TNT, and a pentalite initiator and then the detonator fits into that whole assembly. On the right side of this, you'll see the energy release process. Uh, at the top, labeled detonation, it shows the cigarette-like detonation of this uh, assembly. Uh, it's a, this is anaerobic energy release, so no participa participation from the atmosphere. And below that, you see the growth of the fireball, which uh, is an aerobic energy energy release. And at the very bottom picture, you can see the shock wave leaving the, uh, the fireball. Slide 54. The way we did the experiments was we placed the TNT explosive charge uh, in our uh, blast chamber. Uh, the EPA particle samplers were within the blast chamber behind uh, a shield to prevent any impact from any fragments. And then the gas sampling apparatus was uh, on the other side of the chamber walls, which were two feet thick reinforced concrete. Slide 55. Uh, for simulations of uh, species produced during explosions, we used methods that are qualitatively similar to the gun firings. We used an equilibrium thermodynamic code to predict the chemical species during the anaerobic or detonation part, and the code we used is the cheetah code from Livermore Labs. And what we did is we took the output of cheetah, took all the species, and for each of these gas phase species, compiled a combustion mechanism for burning of that species in air, and then used the uh, combustion simulator Chemkin to predict the species burning following detonation. Slide 56. This slide just gives uh, an indication of permanent species for pre-fireball or what's present at the cessation of detonation prior to expansion of the detonation products, and then post-fireball, what's left over after these detonation products uh, burn in air, and as expected, uh, for the, uh, the pre-fireball, the detonation products, we see the fair amount of unoxidized carbon. Now, these are just gas phase products. What this doesn't show is about 15% of the carbon in neat TNT ending up as soot. So of the gas phase products in the post-fireball, virtually all are uh, converted to CO2. However, as 
slide 57 shows, there is a fair amount of carbon uh, reported here as graphite, but we generally call it soot, uh, that's predicted by the simulator, by the uh, chemical equilibrium blast simulator, Chemkin, about 13% of the carbon ends up uh, as soot, and that accounts for the uh, modified combustion efficiency for neat TNT of uh, 0.866, because we, one of the shortcomings in the simulation is we do a very poor job of accounting for combustion of solid particles of the soot. Slide 58 um, are simulations uh, of the TNT with the 20% by weight additive of metals. So the metal uh, additive was a mixture of magnesium and boron. We chose this because magnesium is known to burn completely in explosive formulations, but boron is known to be really tough to get to burn in explosive formulations. But you'd really like boron to burn in explosive formulations because it's got an extremely high enthalpy of combustion. So in the explosive simulation for the anaerobic part of the energy release, it's possible to calculate the boron as inactive or inert and the boron as active, that is combusting, uh, with available oxygen during the detonation. And these charts show the emission factors, but the most interesting thing about this, uh, from my point of view, is that for the boron inactive, we see a modified combustion efficiency of 0.74, and for boron active, we see a modified combustion efficiency of 0.71. And the, the reason for that is that when the boron is inactive, it's not scavenging any oxygen during the anaerobic detonation. But when the boron is active, it's scavenging oxygen during the detonation, so there's less oxygen to uh, further carbon oxidation, hence we see a lower carbon efficiency. Slide 59. So the actual experiments are, are contradictory to this, but not hugely so. And the main thing from slide 59 to look at is the modified combustion efficiency for TNT and the metallized TNT, magnesium boron. And uh, for the experiments, we got a mean modified combustion efficiency near one. And so the simulation under is under predicting the, the, uh, the MCE. The experiment says we burn much more carbon than we uh, expected. Um, for the particulate, uh, emission factors, well, when we blow up a metal in an explosive, all that metal ends up in particles. So it's not surprising that the metallized uh, material uh, made more particles. And additionally, the, uh, since the magnesium boron, when it reacts uh, in the experiment, uses oxygen, there's also an increase in soot. So it's not surprising on slide 60 that there's an increase in PM10 and PM2.5 relative to TNT for the metallized uh, formulation. Elemental emission factors, um, for neat TNT, the main uh, element we sensed was iron in the particles. Uh, for the metallized uh, TNT formulation, of course, we saw large amounts of boron and magnesium. Uh, the uh, reason for the iron, we believe, is contribution from the walls of our blast chamber. Our blast chamber is five meters by five meters by five meters and is lined with one inch of rolled homogeneous uh, steel armor. Slide 61, just comparing uh, the results from the gun firings and the results from the explosions. And it, the beginning with gun firings on the left of slide 61, the uh, modified combustion efficiency of the experiment was much less than the predicted modified combustion efficiency of the simulation. So the uh, 
simulation over-predicted modified combustion efficiency, and by extension, and also from the data, the simulation under-predicted carbon monoxide. So comparing that to the explosives, the modified combustion efficiency of the simulation was less than the measured modified combustion efficiency. Slide 62. So as some way of uh, rationalizing the, these results, uh, let me just mention some key points. Um, for the gun firings, the, uh, the average CO concentrations uh, of around 15 parts per million uh, suggest that uh, f studies on firing ranges may be warranted, especially for those that are confined, and, and Dr. Gallet touched on this. Um, the emitted particles uh, had uh, median diameters uh, of about half a micron, which uh, it's respirable. You can breathe it in, and it may not come out. And uh, the uh, particulate material at 10 microns or below is near 6%. Copper was the metal, metal observed in highest concentration for all of our round formulations. And uh, <clears throat> we saw more than 100% of the lead in the primer in our, our particle samples. We think this is because uh, for these rounds tested under our conditions, we may have had some lead slug participation in the, uh, in the emissions. And uh, the simulation over predicts the uh, modified carbon efficiency at our probe location and under predicts CO probe uh, location. For uh, the explosions, the emissions from the TNT detonations uh, indicate the carbon burns well, about 98%. We think this is probably because the uh, blast chamber uh, walls provide a reflecting surface for the blast, uh, for the, the shock wave, and the shock wave moves back and forth and mixes up the gases, uh, creating a near homogeneous reactor. And so we see uh, it promotes burning. Um, and interestingly, the addition of the metal to the TNT formulation, which increases blast performance, also increases particulate matter by a factor of eight. And the, uh, the simulation uh, underpredicts the modified combustion efficiency for the explosions compared to uh, experiment. Um, so slide 64. Um, recommendations. Um, what I think both of these uh, uh, sets of experiments indicate is that uh, a real place for improvement is in prediction of particulate matter for gun firings and explosions. For gun firings, uh, certainly in the interior ballistic cycle. Um, for explosions, um, in mostly the fireball stage. Um, one way of, of getting there is to uh, improved prediction of particle combustion kinetics, which means a real improvement in heterogeneous combustion, uh, two-phase combustion. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> for the gun firings, we'd like to see a finite rate gas phase chemical kinetic combustion mechanism incorporated in, into the CFD model to take the next step beyond an equilibrium thermodynamic approach. Uh, one failure on our part is we had a malfunctioning um, hydrogen cyanide detector using a non-dispersive infrared instrument. And so we were, we were short on measurement of HCN, which we know is produced during the firing of the M855 uh, ammo. And uh, again, the, the CO levels uh, are of concern, uh, especially in a uh, closed environment. So I'd, I'd like to uh, thank CERTIP for um, funding us to do this uh, one-year study, and I'd also like to thank uh, the EPA for providing the uh, uh, sampling facilities.
And uh, with that, I'll uh, be glad to field any questions. Thank you, Kevin. We have received a number of questions for you, starting with one from EPA Region 10. Can you please tell us whether the age of the propellant stabilizer affects the emission factors? It probably does, although we didn't investigate that. There is quite a bit of work here at the laboratory looking at uh, that exact question, but we did not focus on that for these tests. So my, I guess my answer is it probably does, but I don't have an idea as to the extent. Thank you. Uh, why is the compilation of a chemical kinetic mechanism for particle burning more difficult than compilation of a mechanism for gas phase combustion? Well, the, um, the gas phase combustion kinetics are uh, well known and have been a pretty intense area of study at universities and research labs for the last 40 years. The particle combustion kinetics are much more difficult because you have you you have to take into account the gas solid interaction, and that the compute the the problem of modeling that while looking at the hundreds of possible reactions that can occur is really difficult, and this has huge implications across um, the, the government and industry. And uh, one of the biggest applications is for um, soot combustion. Uh, burning of a soot particle is the, uh, is the exact problem of a solid particle burning in gas. So uh, it, it's just the chemistry is much more complex and the, uh, the way to determine uh, rate parameters for the reaction um, is really dependent on somebody developing a standardized uh, test for combusting uh, particles. And there are some that exist, but uh, the work to develop a solid phase chemical kinetic or heterogeneous combustion mechanism um, is it's just way behind the homogeneous mechanism. Thank you, Kavan. A question from the Delaware uh, Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control. How confident are you of the explosions data set, which has limited data points? And can you please remind us of the number of replications for the uh, gun firing? Okay, for the gun firing, I think Brian may remember, I think each round we fired 50 of each round. For the explosions, we, uh, for these tests, I think we did a total of eight detonations. And uh, we have a pretty extensive database on the rate of energy release, um, the temperature of um, detonation and of the fireball for um, the TNT explosions prior to reflection from uh, the chamber walls. So they're pretty, I, we think that we did a reasonable job in uh, sampling number and in characterizing of the uh, TNT and metallized TNT detonations. Thank you. A question from the Desert Research Institute. How are emissions measurements in the chamber likely to be different uh, from those in the real world, especially for explosives? Um, in the chamber, as I mentioned, um, you know, typically there's a shock wave that's moving back and forth within the chamber on the order of uh, a millimeter per microsecond, which is a kilometer per second. And so that shock wave moves back and forth, and it's transported by the movement of air molecules uh, or detonation product gas molecules. And so that stirs up the mixture, promotes mixing, promotes burning. In the field, that shock wave uh, 
uh, goes downrange, and the shock wave doesn't promote mixing. Additionally, a lot of explosives are entrained in soil, and that complicates the uh, the emission uh, factor uh, also. Thank you. Um, another question uh, about environmental safeguards. What might be the most important environmental safeguard to include or consider when firing a rifle from an enclosed location based on the results of your work? I would say ventilation. Um, you know, the, the most surprising thing about the gun firings was that the carbon monoxide emissions were higher than predicted by uh, the ARL model, which is arguably the best gun firing simulation model uh, around. Uh, we were very surprised at how high the carbon monoxide levels were uh, within our sampling chamber. So ventilation would be most important. Thank you. On a question from the Navy, have you explored other CFD codes um, uh, to see whether your prediction uh, changes? Uh, we have not. For, for these tests, uh, we just used the in-house model and compared that to um, the Cheetah gun code, which we did not uh, uh, insert into a CFD code. So we just used the one uh, model. Great. Thank you, Kevin. At this point, I'd like to pull um, uh, Brian back into the discussion and also Robin. And I'd like to start with a question for Robin from the Citizens for Safe Water around Badger. Uh, Robin, can you tell us what sort of an ESTCP resources are currently being dedicated to advancing and securing the successful implementation of safer alternatives to OB-OD? Uh, yes, uh, I, I can comment on that. Uh, there have certainly been uh, projects in the past um, I know the question is what's current, but in the past we have looked at incinerators and uh, various other, uh, let's say, closed systems. And again, what we're trying to do in, in all of these is, is ascertain whether it, it provides a better uh, result than open burn, open detonation. Uh, part of, I think, what we have to do is understand uh, the, what's going on first. So um, more recently we are looking at the emission factors and trying to understand what's going on, and hopefully that will then lead us to a position of, uh, of being able to do a, a good comparison of uh, an alternative technique. There are alternatives that have been developed that are, you know, closed chambers and things like that. Um, and, you know, it's just because it's a closed chamber doesn't mean there's no emissions. It just means that you've put those emissions someplace else and, and either have to scrub them or, or do something with them. <clears throat> and as, as Kevin uh, uh, did mention in his uh, response to one of the questions, um, in a closed chamber you do have uh, a lot going on. Uh, so if you're modeling and, and trying to understand what those uh, uh, compounds are that are produced when you uh, blow something up inside a chamber versus uh, what happens in an open environment, uh, it's not a simple uh, answer. So, so I think some of the work we're doing is understanding the emissions first. Um, a, another comment on this is that in the past we did uh, fund efforts, and, and uh, Kevin's effort is one of those, on understanding uh, how we could uh, eliminate, uh, let's say, I shouldn't say eliminate, how we could understand uh, better ways of uh, detonating or blowing up or burning uh, or having alternative methodologies. There's, there's some ongoing projects right now that should be coming to their conclusion in the next year or two. Uh, they're focused on, uh, let's say, single ordinance items, not focused on uh, large-scale open burn, open detonation. So it's an area that, that is ripe. It is an area that we could be investing something in. Thank you so much, Robin.
And then for Brian and Kevin, and uh, we'll start with you, Brian. Can you tell us uh, how EPA and ARL came to work together on this project? Uh, yes, sure. We responded to a solicitation uh, that was a need identified by the CERTIP office, and we wrote a proposal which was uh, both internally reviewed at CERTIP and externally reviewed and uh, funded as a one-year sort of what they call a seed or sort of a pilot project to see whether these methods would be successful in application to both the gun firing and the detonations. And so we entered into an interagency agreement, and, uh, and it's worked out pretty well. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, would you like to add anything? Uh, we had worked, I guess, about 15 years ago with Brian, um, and so w we were aware of uh, their sampling capabilities, and um, it seemed like a, a really good mix of uh, a portable, really extensive chemical analysis laboratory uh, to our blast chambers, which aren't, aren't always the friendliest of environments. Thank you both. And starting with you, Kevin, can you please share with us how your research efforts will continue to evolve and what is next for you uh, in this area of work? Sure. We're, um, we have several parallel efforts. Uh, as I mentioned, we're really interested in heterogeneous chemical combustion. Uh, we're really interested at, uh, in when a metal additive begins to participate in the energy release process um, in an explosion. And there is some indication from some of our other work that if you can tailor the time at which a metallic additive begins to react in a detonation, that you can really sharply influence the accumulation of soot in, uh, in your final uh, products. Thank you, Kevin. What about you, Brian? What's next for you? So we will have uh, on the schedule a couple different site visits this year in which we will be determining emission factors for specific uh, sites and uh, different uh, and static fire technologies. Uh, we also have the opportunity, and we would like to pursue two things. One is the development of another test method or an OTM method, which is uh, which would cover the gamut of all these samplers in the outdoor environment for quantifying these large open area sources. And we'd also like to be able to pursue validation of the uh, model that the Department of Defense uses to uh, estimate uh, dispersion of these pollutants. It's called OBODM for Open Burn, Open Detonation Model. And the, the ability of the, the drone or the UAS to fly through the plume and do transects and follow downwind suddenly gives you a three-dimensional data set in which one can actually validate these plume dispersion models for probably the first time ever. Thank you very much. Um, as we get ready to wrap up, one final question for both of you. Um, starting with you, Brian, what is the single last message you would like to leave our audience with today? Well, I'd like to say that the, uh, despite the huge challenges in quantifying open area sources that in the last 10 years, less than that even, we've advanced this substantially uh, over the common uh, traditional stack, stack type sampling methods. And we've employed a lot of new technologies, which have obviously been applicable to a, a large variety of sources from uh, gun firing to uh, detonations. And Kevin? Um, I guess, I guess uh, mainly that uh, energetic materials, chemistry and physics is um, a super interesting field and that it has applications to all sorts of uh, concerns in life from just everyday power generation to safety. There's also security aspects in protecting people from, you know, harm when they're in the vicinity of these materials. So I, 
I think uh, you know I encourage people to get into the uh, chemistry and physics of energetic materials, and that it's a it's not a solved problem. It's a it's a problem that has a huge number of new avenues to pursue. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Brian. You guys have done a wonderful job. And as we wrap up, I'd like to remind our audience that the next CERTIP and ESCCP webinar uh, is on Thursday, February 22nd. It will be in the Environmental Restoration Program area, and it will cover the topic of natural attenuation of chlorinated ethenes. Uh, this webinar will feature two speakers, Dr. Michelle Scherer from the University of Iowa and Dr. John Wilson from Scissortail Environmental. Uh, registration is open, so please visit the CERTIP and ESTCP webinar web, web, web page to register for this and other future webinars. Before we conclude, I would like to remind you that both the audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on our webinar web page in case you would like to refer to them in the future. We would appreciate it at this time if you could please take a moment to complete the very short survey that will pop up on your screen at this time. This concludes today's webcast. Thank you for your time.